I said to my mother, when I grow up, I want to be a barrister and I'm never going to change my mind. So tell us about Christian Concern. It's really important for our clients that they know they've come to a place where they're loved and they're protected and that we will seek justice for them. It's hundreds of thousands of pounds of work every single year yeah. if we were to have charged it, but right. we don't. The law is changing, but what about the culture in the court? So if a church follows culture, we are meant to set the standards. Mm for the whole world. That's a catastrophe for our society. The church needs to know about this. We need to know about this so that we can act. Incredible. Hello and welcome to God TV Together, the podcast. It's so nice to welcome you to a very special conversation, one that I am actually exceedingly excited to do today. Uh, it's with uh, somebody that I've been fanboy fanboying over for a long time. And actually, over the last few days, we've been interviewing some of her clients. So we get the exciting opportunity to interview Andrea Williams. Andrea, welcome to the show. It's great to be with you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you. And um, Andrea, we always say on these podcasts, it's really important to, uh, that as Christians, we're discerning of the information that we take on and what we hear about what we think God is saying and how he's working in our lives. Um, and we've heard from some of your clients and they've been very, you know, uh, complimentary and, uh, you know, blowing your trumpet really hard. So this is a really important interview because you're you're the CEO of Christian Concern and you're leading that organisation. So I'd really like to get to know who is Andrea? Yeah. You know, what is your testimony? Yes. You know, who is Andrea the little girl? You know, like, yeah. how did you meet God? Yeah. Well, it does start right back then. It starts right back at the very uh, beginning. Um, my my parents, um, when I was born, they, they, they weren't Christians at that time. My father was the youngest of 10 children. And he wow. was born in Italy. And he'd um, come across, really, he was just traveling through the United Kingdom. He'd been sent to a seminary to become a priest. He caught the eye of a pretty woman, uh, age 16, in a, in, a, uh, in a piazza in Rome, and he said, I'm no priest. <laughs> he became a cordon bleu cook, and he was traveling through Europe and then into England, and he um, was in Salisbury, and there he met my mother, wow. who was only 15 at the time. And uh, on their first date, he said, I will never marry an English woman. <laughs> But within a year, he was married, wow. and I came along um, very soon thereafter. Um, but they weren't, at that time, Christians. Um, however, uh, he got a job in Portland in Dorset in the south of England, mm. and um, there was a Methodist church, Eastern Methodist church, and we lived on a new build estate. And I, One of my earliest memories is my father helping the builders, laying the bricks, for a little bungalow that we had. Wow. Um, and the Methodist church sent a minibus around the local estate and picked up all the children that were living on this estate. And I was one of the children that had got onto that bus. Wow. And um, I went to uh, the Sunday why, school. Why do you think your mum and dad let you do that? They've definitely never allowed that now, right? Well, they all, just think about all the rules. We right. wouldn't be able to get on a bus. We wouldn't, I mean, there would be, there, there would be all kinds of forms to sign. It just wouldn't happen. Right. Um, but it was 19, it was nine, it was 1969. And Mrs. Hicks, my first Sunday school teacher, told me all about Jesus. And I can, I can picture the room. Uh, exactly, I can. I know exactly the the rows of little chairs that were out. Mrs. Hicks told me, all, and there was a birthday chair that was red. We used to love to wait to sit on that <laughs> birthday chair that was red. But anyway, I loved this place. Wow! And I fell in love with Jesus, and I can't remember a moment when I have not loved Him That's incredible. since that time. Um, it was just very deep, and you see, I just believed everything that the teachers told me. Mm. And I think we have that. I think about that quite often now because I think what is it that our society what is it that the teachers what is it that we're putting into our little children mm. well Mrs Hicks put into me a passion for Jesus Christ and that he was true and then Mrs Hips my next Sunday school teacher not Mrs Hicks Mrs Hips said the best present I could ever have was a bible and to read it every day and I received a bible and almost every day from that day to this I have read my bible wow 
Um, and so again, what are we putting into our children? Mm. And then at age, and my parents, you know, they loved the fact that I was going. They, I'd come home, I'd, I'd have these little, they were called tip tops. They, to, we had to fill, we had to fill them in and present them back and learn Bible verses. And all, I did this every single week. My mum still got these um, in the loft at home. And so um, I took it all very seriously. My parents loved me taking it seriously. Um, and my sister, who was two years younger, she followed through. She too became a Christian. Wow. My brother, who's 16 years younger than me, and my mum was a young mum to me, and then she had my brother 16 years later. We all became Christians. And really, my mum and dad followed from from that. And right. so what's the extraordinary thing is through the work of a Sunday school, um, my family really became Christian. Yeah, like grassroots church. Just real It's so church. easy to dismiss that sometimes. Yeah, and and I, it's so important. It's so important. I just think, and, just, and I think just generally, um, I think what I, what I want to say to God TV listeners is, cherish your own children uh, and really look after them and really pour the love of God into them. But also consider the children all around you and wherever you are in the local church, you know, seek ways of really bringing them in. Mm -hmm. Because it's sad to me that one of the saddest things in our society today is that little four-year-olds um, are not getting that amazing truth. You're right. made in the image of God. God wow. has a plan and a purpose uh, for you. You're precious and esteemed in his sight. You don't need to worry. He knows every hair on your head. I mean, these are wonderful truths that were put into my heart. And the story of Christian concern, I believe, starts right back then. Wow. I absolutely believe it starts back then because it was like a little child was captured uh, by by his love and his truth and, and just and being so real. Your work, your ministry comes out of comes, that. Comes out of that. And and then the, the kind of next sort of childhood story that, which of course with the eyes of now being 58, with the, so you see all of this in God's uh, own, arch of your life story yeah. but is that aged eight I was home from school and with chicken pox right and I watched Crown Court on the television which was the first legal program ever the best legal program ever with judges and wigs and gown and counsel and juries and um and I said to my mother when I grow up I want to be a barrister and I'm never going to change my mind at eight at eight wow and um at that time, we were living in a little guest house, as in we bought, my father it was very entrepreneurial. He'd saved all his tips from working as a cordon bleu chef, head waiter. Um, so we were living on a little business. I loved living on a little business. That was fantastic. You know, I was serving at the tables when I used to say, to go to the guest and say, would you like orange juice, cornflakes? Fry breakfast, scrambled eggs on toast. I used to do all of this when I was a little girl. I can see little, little Andrea <laughs> yeah, I doing it. Little, now. <laughs> I love do, I love doing that. I love doing that. And um, so we were a fa we were a family business, um, and um, so that was great. But that night after watching Crown Court again, I had this basil brush carpet. I go into these specifics because it's all very specific. That I shared a bunk bed with my sister and had a basil brush carpet that I used to pray on every single night before getting into bed. It was my routine. It was God bless mum, God bless dad, God bless Sam the cat. God, you know, so on. Amen. Yeah. And then there was a, like a PS every single night. And dear Lord Jesus, if it is your will, please may I pass the 11 plus so that I can go to the grammar school. And I prayed that prayer every night because I figured that the only way that a little girl like me had any chance of becoming a barrister, of going to university, we were mm. in a different time then entirely, mm. was if I passed the 11 plus and went from Portland to Weymouth on the mainland to the grammar school. Yeah, and how, I guess it, it's important to give context for that time. I mean, there wouldn't have been a lot of um, working class barristers at that time. No. Uh, neither women barristers, no. I think. So to have that dream was was a big dream. It, it was, know? it was, it was, you see, the thing is, where did that come from? And, I, and where did that come from? And this is, and it was so, I was totally determined. I, I was totally normal to me. So it had to be God. Mm -hmm. It had to have been God placing that, that in me. I loved him really passionately. I believed in him, in him entirely. I prayed all the time. I used to write in the back of my books, you know, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Right. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He will make your path Amen. straight. I used to read on all of my exercise books. 
I used to, uh, at school, I used to put, in fact, I did actually get told off once for putting Bible verse, so maybe I'll you know, a Bible verse in the back of my exercise, but, but the point was, that's what I did. In, uh, I used to write that on the back, in, in the back, in the back of my, all my exercise books um, at school. So it was all very real to me, apart from, and it seemed entirely normal, right. because this was just how I was um, living. And so again, I just think all the time, and having raised four children now myself, and loving so many of the children in our in church in the church and and loving children just generally, um, God God loves them and speaks to them and um, is real to them mm. and places ideas and dreams in their hearts and isn't it wonderful if if their hearts and their minds and their souls are captured by Him for His purposes yeah. rather than being captured by the world. It strikes me as uh, probably true that everyone has a dream when they're a child, you know, whether it's to be a barrister or a football or a yeah. fireman, whatever it is. Um, and it's, but it's it, probably incredibly rare that people then see that through. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's where you point to God, you know, like it, it was more than just uh, I'd like to be, yeah. you know, it was this God-given desire and... And uh, he says, doesn't he? He will put the, you know, put, desire yeah, in you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he, he clearly, he clearly did that. So, you know, you, 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 moving on from eight, what happens then? You know, you go to school and you. Yeah, I was very during my teenage years quite a serious student. I mean, God, I think I say a serious, and I, I knew that I had, to, I felt like I. I felt like I passed it. I felt like he'd helped me to pass eleven plus. That I had to work really hard, and I really wanted to go to university. And as you were saying, it was a totally different time. So this, I felt very privileged to even be have the possibility of going because I would be the first person in my family that would go to university across yeah, wow. both families. Yeah. Um, big so deal. this was this was all quite. This was it was a big thing, and so I felt quite serious about all of that. I remember at age. I suppose this is quite important too. I remember at age 15, I stood up. I, I was taken this time by um, uh, um, Miss, Mr. Hicks. Uh, so the husband of my... I'm impressed <laughs> you remember everybody's yeah, yeah. name. But I, but I was taken, I mean, again, but you know, he was absolutely wonderful, but I was taken by him to a youth rally in London um, at Westminster Hall, uh, at, at Central Methodist Hall. And... And it was as if my childhood faith went to adult faith. And I said, Lord Jesus, I am surrendered um, to you. Amen. I'll go wherever you have me go. I'll do whatever you'll have me do. Please, could I still be a barrister? <laughs> <laughs> and so that, but I did actually feel surrendered at that point. Right. And I suppose the other thing I felt is that as my, my, as I was getting older was, well, I want more than the, the thing that matters is that he is famous, that his name is known, mm. that people are saved. Right. And so there was that heart's desire to be a barrister still. I, that's my, that was my path. But I also felt um, that, Lord, if, you, if the call is to a mission field, and of course, at that time, I was thinking like just a mission field mm. where I will go. I'll go wherever you have me go. I'll do whatever you will have me do. Whatever your call is on my life, I'm ready. I'm surrendered. And I want that. That that was really it. Because I I couldn't bear I, and I still cannot bear the idea that one person is lost. Right. I mean, I think that's one of the hard. This is one of the hardest things in really loving Christ. I mean, if we stepped outside the studio and saw, and we will step into a busy street, won't we? Mm -hmm. And there are, well, we're, we're filming in London. There are 10.2 million, sorry, there are, yeah, uh, there are 10 million people in London. Um, how many of them know Christ? Right. The, I mean, I, that- 2%. Ag that's agony to me. It's, it is actually like an agony, yeah. and the agony doesn't go. Mm. The that the re the agony really doesn't go. The idea because if this is God is a God of love. Jesus Christ died on the cross for each one of us, for every one of those people, um, that they might know Him, um, and that sacrifice was for our eternity. Right, and. 
so I've all, I mean, even from, so from the moment I could really understand the gospel in that way and the importance of it, then the idea that anybody would be lost, mm. is it, that's actually too much to bear. It's too much to bear when you really mm. think about it. It's too much to bear. Mm. But for the fact that Christ, but for the fact that we can live with the peace of God every day and know that, that we are so confined, as in I'm confined in a human body, I'm confined at this moment of time, mm. I'm confined for the years that the Lord gives me on this earth. And somehow he is out with this. He's bigger than all of this and can put it all together. And it's just. But I live in a world where that rages. There's a kind of torment that rages in me. Yeah. In terms of, in terms of that truth and and wanting his name to be known, made known, and seeing a world that rebels against him. So would would you identify the evangelist in you at that early age, or you know, has that been a thread through your life? Because evangelist and barrister yeah. don't often go <laughs> yeah. hand in hand, I imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure how yeah. how welcomed an evangelist yeah. is in a court, you I know? Think, <laughs> I think, well, I think what's interesting about that is, you know, when I think about that is that when I was younger, people used to say to me a lot when I was younger and in my in my teens and in my 20s, you're an evangelist. Right. Uh, so they used to say that to me, you're an evangelist. So they recognise I didn't necessarily, I would never have said that to myself, but they used to say, you're an evangelist. Yeah. Um, I, um, and I, so I think that therefore, the surprise to me in some ways in God's shaping of my life is that, and when I look back, is that I love, I love, seeing people know Jesus. Mm -hmm. And very often you just have to get them to a place through one of the courses, Alpha, Discovering Christianity, whatever it might be. And we've done this, my husband and I have done this a lot, you know, um, in, in our living room and so on. When people come in, if they come back a second week, then they're hungering. Yeah. And when the gospel is alive, the gospel is power. Mm -hmm. So when you really introduce them to the gospel, which is power, um, and they're hungering for it, we see lives change. We see miracles. We see, and we see, and it's always a miracle. Mm. I'm always amazed. When I, I was always amazed in these situations when people would sit with my husband and I in this situation, how they would become Christians. And I, I, you could never say, well, I did a really good uh, explanation of the gospel. There were really good apologetics. It was always by the power of God. Right. Some amazing something happened something, outside of it, your control. It, it was all of that is amazing. But I tell you another story on this that you've prompted. Uh, one uh, that you've reminded me of, uh, because you talked about barrister and evangelist. I had this great client. Um, well, I say great. He was he's called Colin. <laughs> he was one of my first cases, and um, he was at the time very young, fifteen or sixteen, and um, he was involved in very you know shoplifting, petty crime, um, and. Our c criminal careers progressed together in our early years. So he kind of <laughs> so got more and more great, serious crime. Yeah. <laughs> wasn't great for yeah, him. Yeah. And and if he got arrested, he used to say, "I want my brief. I want Miss Minichiello." He used to say, "I want my brief. I want Miss Minichiello." So I would go and find Colin, and um, he. So I knew him over several years, um, and then. We got to a place, as I say, when he was getting more involved in more and more serious crime. He ended up doing domestic burglary, so that's serious. Um, and he ended up um, in a cell. Uh, he ended up now then in prison and facing, um, he pleaded guilty and he was now facing to about 30 charges. Right, well. So we're several years in, facing sentencing and he's wrecked. He's absolutely wrecked at this point. He used to say, Miss, miss, if you marry me, I'll reform. I promise <laughs> if you marry me, I'll reform. That was Colin. I, I had a big soft spot for Colin. The thing about this was, though, he, got, he was there, he was in a cell um, and very unwell, um, even to the extent of being on suicide watch. I went back four weeks later for sentencing, so to go and see him in his cell and to go up in, and it was in inner London Crown Court. And I remember, I can picture it exactly. I was going to go um, up to read his report. He said to me, Miss, he look, I saw him, he looked totally different. I said, Colin, you look so well. You're different. What's happened? 
Miss, I found Jesus. Wow. The chaplain told me all about Jesus. Um, he's everything I, I, I ever want to know. Um, I'm different. And I said, that's amazing, Colin, <laughs> because I love Jesus too. Wow. Um, he said, Miss, why didn't you ever tell me? Wow. Miss, why didn't you ever tell me? And that's quite something to hear and to yeah. receive, especially when you love Christ as I love Christ. Right. It hurts. That would hurt. Mm. You know, and there's a whole load of Collins out there in the world, you know, where the love of Christ, the love of Christ and the, God, the power of the gospel is, that, is what will change and transform. And he is a transformed, mm. he's transformed. He married the mum of his children. Uh, he has, you know, he is entirely changed. And so the gospel ultimately is the ultimate answer. And that was, that was, a, that was like a, a jolt for me yeah. as well. Yeah. Because I was doing, I'd have been doing a lot of evangelism in yeah. church and, and and all of these things, but you know. Can I ask a question? Because I want to, I want to, I want to tie something together. So you obviously did well at uni, uh, became a barrister, but you became a defence barrister as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. an interesting choice yeah, yes, as a Christian, yes, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. I was a, I was, um, um, I was. So in my twenties, so what, what? So I went to university in Wales, in Cardiff, and in Pisa, in Italy, and then I. Um, did the Inns of Court School of Law, so the professional uh, qualifications there. I was called to the bar at the Inner Temple. Um, and I studied, I did eight years um, in chambers in criminal and family law. Wow. Um, and I, I, I both prosecuted and defended because you do both of those. You do, but you get what's given to you. Right. And I began also to develop a sort of, ex, this was, wasn't something I was looking for, but I began to develop a specialism in, um, looking in situations where mums with learning disabilities wanted to keep their children. Okay. And so I began to kind of en ha develop a niche practice right. um, with vulnerable mums and their children. Mm -hmm. So that was also happening. It was just that this is what was happening in my in my 20s. Right. Um, the, in my 20s as well, I was pioneering the work of the Lawyers Christian Fellowship um, and it was the era still of Lord Denning. He was the president of the Lawyers Christian Fellowship and amazing, well-known people at the time, um, such as Val Grieve, who was a well-known lawyer at the time. Um, he wrote a, a, a famous apologetics book on the resurrection. And I was, um, I thought it was really normal to know Lord Denning and Lord Mackay of Clashburn because these were all people that were in and around the inner temple. I got to know them. I don't know if you remember the Carl Bridgewater trial in my chambers as well, the paper boy that was murdered in the 1980s. I became junior, junior, junior counsel on that case. So that was an amazing break to sit in the Royal Courts of Justice and be listening to the most famous QCs of their day. Yeah, wow. Um, I was running around you taking notes. You thought it was notes. normal, right? I thought this was all normal. Right. I thought this was all normal. So that little girl from Portland in Dorset who grew up on a family business, who served at the tables, was, was at meetings with Lord Denning. I was in, a, in, the, in the Royal Courts of Justice, where I go quite often still, but I was there listening to four, King, four Queen's Council make arguments on an appeal case, which lasted many weeks. So and explain, explain to me the, the um, uh, enormous, like the, the no, like how, enormous and important the royal courts are because I used to work on Chancery Lane yeah, yeah. and I've been in the courts many times and used yeah. to hang out with lawyers. Yeah. Um, but, the, you know, for, for me, I, I mean, I, till I'd been in and understood how justice is practised there yeah. and the kind of court uh, yeah. cases that are tried there, I hadn't really understood, like, it, it, that's a big deal, right? Like, yes, yeah. Because we'll have international viewers and they won't know what the royal courts are. Yes, but it's really are. where it's, it's not, it's, it's where most of the appeal works. So when cases are setting precedents right. for the law, how law, how law, how the law is carried out, how the law is made. So it's at an appeal, it becomes the laws that set the kind of constitutional parameters. Sets the precedent. Sets the precedent, yeah. which then applies in law going forward. Right. So this is again, so this is amazingly where I was placed in my in my in my twenties. And um and I and I I really thank God for, for 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 those years for those years of experience. And I remember Lord Denning 
um, Lord Denning saying to me, and I, I was also working quite a lot with young student lawyers, even though I was young myself at that time, I took up a role within the Lawyers Christian Fellowship um, to focus on young student lawyers doing evangelism. It was all about uh, filling the filling our inner temple church, filling it for, with evangelistic events at Christmas and Easter uh, and so on. And we did. And we then had, out, during, then in those years, we had big outreach dinners at major hotels like the Savoy, 500 lawyers in the room, Chuck Colson would come. All of this this kind of stuff I thought was all very normal. Yeah, I thought it was all very, Lord Mackay would, uh, would invite everyone. And I thought all of that was very normal. Um and you know what? It kind of is normal in that that you just when you just keep on step, you keep on trusting God, doing what He sets before you, uh, love Him, attempt things for Him. You might fall flat on your face, but you just do all of this. But all these people love God, and they were there because they were in the Lawyers Christian Fellowship at the time. Um, so there was a sense. Um, Lord Denning said to me. Never change, young lady. You'll go far," he said to me. "Never change, uh, young lady. You'll go far." Um, and I used to. And then when he actually did leave the bench, um, I used to take once a quarter. I used to take young student lawyers to have fish and chips with him oh, lovely. at his home um, on a fr- on a on a, fr- on a on a Friday. Um, but I, the, the change came. We're now sort of let in the like late nineteen eighties into the, sorry, we're now in the sort of mid nine, late nineteen eighties into the nineties. Um, I began to see that our laws were moving away from a Lord Denning type of framework or a Lord Mackay framework. In the and I say Lord Denning would talk profoundly and profusely in his judgments about. The law being rooted in Christianity, right. the law being moral. He'd mm-hmm. actually talk, talk mm-hmm. in those terms mm-hmm. about how it was Christianity that had given us the foundation of our lawmaking. Mm-hmm. This was normal. Mm-hmm. This was normal speak. Yeah, it was the premise. It was the premise for the creation upon creation of our law. The premise upon which everything was given. Um, but I began to see that with the the advent of human rights legislation which were meant for good. But what you began to see was a shift away from understanding that law was given by God, mm-hmm. that there were norms, mm-hmm. that there were right, there was a right and a wrong, that there were That we answers, weren't making judgment of, that we, but that was given to it us. It was given to us. Mm-hmm. That, um, and it was a, that we, men and women, had dignity because we have God-given dignity, mm-hmm. that we are equal because... God creates us equal, yeah. different but equal. Right. Um, that these that we are to love one another as we love our neighbour. That we're to do right. Ten commandments were inscribed on the walls of many of the courts. You yeah. know, in God we trust. All of these things mm-hmm. are part of our were part of our institutional fabric. But in the 1990s, we began to shift away from that. And what became interesting to me was this: that we could do amazing outreach dinners. Fill the fill the temple church with carol with carol service outreach, um, but when we began to talk about the erosion of laws that protect life, because this was hap- in the nineteen in nineteen ninety, for instance, there was a Human Fertilization and Embryology Act, mm-hmm. which for the first time create allowed for the permission of the creation of embryos. Right. With the express purpose of experimenting upon them and destroying them. Right. That was a new thing. Right. Because this, so we were creating life to destroy life. Right. That's not good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but suddenly it became something that, that, so I, I was exercised by this. I thought, well, how can that be right? How can we be destroying, creating life and destroying life? And this is in law. So I began to ask those questions. Right. And that's, and then I, so that's how I started um, through a, I set up a series of monthly seminars and it was essentially um, Christian lawyers thinking about current policy issues, public issues, legal issues. Mm -hmm. How was that received? Because 
I, I, I've got a rose tinted view of the courts being very Christian at the time you were talking about it, and you know that being welcomed. Because um, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm enlightened actually to hear that it was like that. You know, I know our law was based on, yeah. you know, yeah. f- from God, but I, I hadn't really known that people were taking that seriously. Almost, you know, you know, like because yeah. I imagine it's not the same now, um, and and also. Uh, I'm really interested in how, like, Colin giving you that, you know, yeah. shocking moment. Yeah. Like, how that would then definitely drive yeah. you yeah. to be like, hold on a minute, the court is changing and I want to tell everybody about Jesus. So, so yeah. So, what So what happens uh, next? You know, you set, you set, you, yeah. you're trying set to evangelise and the law is changing, but what about the culture in the court? Yeah. Well, I suppose what I found was, um, what I found in trying, in saying to Christian lawyers, um, the, the, we're making bad laws, and who does God have to think about this apart from us? Right. And what I suddenly, what I found at that point, was that that was the beginning. It was as if I'd done my, all my twenties and been. Um, a bit of a golden girl. I didn't. I wouldn't have called myself a golden, but it was like that's a great event. Well done, thank you, and yeah, yeah, wonderful. This is great. You're here's your brief, and you're going to go there. And suddenly, what happened was, um, people were not so keen, right, on dealing with the the presenting issues of the day, where we were weakening marriage. Yeah, the repeal of Section Twenty Eight. I was there. I mean, I'm an old warhorse. So we we stood against the, you know that was at that time homosexuality the, as a as a family characteristic as a norm could not be taught in schools. Right. This is now the middle of the. Um, this is 1997-1998, and at that point, um, I felt that it was good for our children to be told that marriage was between a man and a woman, mm-hmm. and and to be kept pure, mm-hmm. and to have God's morality taught in schools. Mm-hmm. So. As soon as um, I began to contend in that space, that's when I began to have the hostility come, began to have hostility come at me. And there's a sense in which... uh, Do you have an example when you think of a a time when you were just like, (gasps) like, you know, shocked by this isn't... I haven't run into this before because I've been encouraged... Yeah. About my faith before now. Well, it was, I mean, that was it. I mean, it was on, as soon as, so we had, there was a whole series of laws. So you go then, so you go from the 1990 Act where we were liberalising abortion laws. And I knew, we could already see the catastrophe of what had happened since the passing. I was only, I mean, in 1967, I was two years of age. (laughs) So when the, the abortion Act was passed. But what we began to see was numbers were much bigger Right. And again, isn't the law meant to protect life? How do we value life? Doesn't law give life? Mm-hmm. Does it, does not if the church cannot speak on this, if lawyers cannot speak on this, then who will? Mm-hmm. And do not we want do we not want to protect the most vulnerable in our society? Mm-hmm. And this is and because we have we have this rescue redemption package. We have the full hope of the gospel. And this is one of God's laws that we are eroding. Mm-hmm. We are sacrificing our children because of our behaviour. Mm-hmm. And, and that is something that kind of is all, that's written in the Bible. We see mm-hmm. it all, it's, that's what civilizations do that begin to re- re- reject God. If we don't uphold marriage, if we, if we celebrate sexual immorality, um, and for this, you know, the, the important thing is, again, you know, God has the standard of marriage is that sexual expression is is only between one man and one woman marriage mm-hmm. for with for life. But what we began to have then at the turn of the century was the civil partnerships, which recognised same-sex relationships. But that wasn't. They said this is all just about rights. It's never going to become marriage. Remember, there was no concept when I qualified in the whole of the country that marriage would be come between two men or two women. I think people forget that now. But there was to be no idea that in law you could redefine marriage. Mm-hmm. In fact, before 1967, you'd have never thought that you could take the life of a child in the womb. Right. That was unthinkable. Yeah. I think we've lived with it for so long 
that we think these things are all normal, when in fact they were unthinkable. Well, I think they are. I think people would be aghast at your stance, you know, if you were to look at the world now of that you could think other than what is, is, is incorrect. Yeah, yeah. That's how much culture has shifted yeah. in such a tiny space. What do you think came first? Um, do you think the cultural shift came first or the legal changes? Um, the law... The law follows the culture. Right. Uh, Parliament follows the culture, and indeed, indeed, what we've, I mean, what we've, what we've also seen, is that um, we've also seen the church following culture. Right. So, if a church follows culture, uh, when we are meant to be mm -hmm. the hope of the world, mm -hmm. we are meant to set the standards mm -hmm. for the whole world, and when we, so when we follow culture then that's a catastrophe for our society. Mm -hmm. It's a catastrophe for us, our society mm -hmm. because we have all the beauty mm -hmm. and all the truth and all the law, mm -hmm. God's law. God's law is so good. It's for our good. And when good law is at the root of a government, when um, it gives people moral courage and it makes a nation healthy, happy and whole mm -hmm. and albeit imperfectly, but the reason why Great Britain has been great is because essentially in our unwritten constitution, um, dating right back to the Magna Carta, God has been central. In fact, Jesus Christ has been central. Mm -hmm. And we've taken his name out of the public discourse right. when actually he's King of Kings, Lord of Lords, uh, the Redeemer, the Judge, in him all things hold together. And why have we been ashamed of his name when mm. he is the answer? Well, he's still the head of our institutions, technically, you know, through a crown and a crown court and yeah. a crown police service. And, yeah. you know, everything in England is established under the crown in his name. In and, his and name. yet, you're right, his name has been taken out of the public discourse. Yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's a challenge. So it is, but my message then to, the, to God TV viewers is make his name famous, make him known. Do not be ashamed of the gospel. Do not be ashamed of Jesus and his words, all the truth that flows from him. Yeah, it's a good encouragement. So, so Andrea, when does Christian concern start? So, you, you know, we're, we're, we got to about your mid thirties, I think, and, yeah. and, uh, and, and stop. So what happens next? Um, well, the what really happened was that um, Christian concern, I was going back, I have got married in 1990, had four children in quite, six, quite quick succession from 1995. Um, and I was doing all this work at that time that enabled me to write briefings into Parliament because I was at home with the children. So this right. is another God, because I'm a woman, what happened was suddenly I was on a, I loved my job and I was so, I didn't want to stop. I mm -hmm. did not want to stop being at the bar at all. Um, now, then I got given my, my, my darling Lily and I felt like no one had ever been a mother before because she was the most <laughs> extraordinary thing that I'd ever seen in my in the whole. She was never going to cry. Her life was always going to be wonderful, and uh, and I so I just was entirely besotted with this baby. But what given me? But when God gave me babies, what it meant was that I was taken out of the courtroom for mm -hmm. a time, and I was writing papers into Parliament because you can do that when you you can do that when you've got babies at home. You can you can write. You can you can. There's a lot that you can still do have one baby, then two babies, then three babies. And um, I was going back to my chambers. And do you know, at this point, the, the work had begun to grow. So I say this is kind of when Christian Concern started. Right. I was still doing it with the Lawyers Christian Fellowship, but it, this is when it started. And um, the I was going back to my chambers and I was skipping, running back to chambers because I found that the work I was doing in Parliament was... The, the work I was doing was becoming very, it felt very hard right. because of the hostility. Right. And so I wanted to go back to the place I understood. Yeah. The work was easier in chambers. Defend, right. you know, doing criminal trials in the Old Bailey mm -hmm. was easier than... And than being in Parliament. Be, and being and writing, speaking Christianly right. about the laws. Right. And so, um, but in fact, God gave us our fourth child, Nancy Rose, who was our little surprise baby. <laughs> and we always say she's the public policy baby. <laughs> and she was, um, so she came along in 2002. And that was, and I, my husband said to me, um, 
he said to me when um, I discovered I was pregnant with Nancy Rose, he said, and that's because the Lord wants you where you are. Mm. And I knew at that moment I was never going back to my chambers. Wow. And so that was 2001, because she was born in, in 2002. And... And that that was really it. And so Christian and so Christian Concern and Christian Legal Centre were then, I was getting cases coming to me, people being removed from beginning already beginning to be removed from jobs and so on. Right. So I began to do those cases. Um, and get like another specialism all yeah, over again. That's how it happened. Yeah. So God really handed it to you. Yeah. It wasn't something you sought out. No. Yeah. Incredible. Incredible. So tell us about you know Christian Concern. Tell us, you know, um, like when did it like officially start, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. what do you, what are your aims, what are you trying to achieve, yeah. you know? It, it was at the beginning, so if it, well, Christian Legal Centre, so there's sort of like, there's the two, two sides of one coin, which is the Christian, yeah. because, because I wasn't intending to start it, because it, we ha I was working with the Lawyers Christian Fellowship, I had my chambers, but Lawyers Christian Fellowship said to me, if you want to do the cases, you can do them, but not, under our name, because we're a prayer union. Right. Yeah. So we started the Christian Legal Centre. Right. And started doing the cases. Right. Um, Christian unions being thrown out of student unions. This kind, these kind of, these were the early cases. We had one or two a year. And that's a Christian all. Legal Centre. Because yeah. people use the names interchangeably. They do because they are because essentially they're related. Again, yeah. if you if you were starting this, if you were kind of marketing this and thinking about it in theory, you wouldn't have two organisations. No. Yeah, that's, but that's how it started. Right. Um, and it is exactly what it says on the tin. The Christian Legal Centre right. <laughs> helps people helps people in trouble with the law. And so we that's so we started that to run the cases. And Christian Concern, there was someone in my ch church, um, Linfield, in Linfield, where we were living at the time. Um, he was a regular member of the congregation, but he and his, his wife and I had had babies at exactly the same time. I'd had my son at exactly... And we became good friends. And you're getting lots of detail here at God TV. Oh, it's great. Yeah. It's fantastic. Um, but the... Uh, um, Shout out to the wonderful David Clark. But anyway, that was David Clark um, in All Saints Linfield. And he said to me, your work is so important. This is in 2002, 2003. When you speak to me and you tell me all about the civil partnerships or the religious hatred bill, our very, when our very freedom to preach the gospel was under threat in 2003, 2004, mm -hmm. he said, not just about law, the, the, the church needs to know about this. We need to know about this so that we can act. And it was kind of the internet was just starting. And he, he then, um, we've been going for a while, but you know, uh, he was creating websites and he created this website called Christian Concern for Our Nation. He said, here you are, Andrea, this is yours. Right. This is for you to wow. tell the nation about your work. David Clark, David Clark, David and Claire Clark. And so they, so we then began to get names of people that wanted to hear about the work, or really specifically about the religious hatred bill, and I was inputting names in the ba in between the baby's naps, so that people would hear about what was going on in Parliament. I was calling them to Parliament to rally. I don't know if you can remember any of those early rallies in two thousand two, three, four. Suddenly, outside Parliament, we were singing "Amazing Grace" in order for all the gospel to be protected in this country. Wow. Thousands were rallying, and at that time, I got to meet Ade Amuba. Yeah, who came um, into this work um, from Nigeria, Sam Solomon, who was a convert from Islam, David Clark, Paul Diamond, Paul Eddy. These were we these these extraordinary people all came together and we were working in the law, in media, in the churches. Like real majors in the faith. We were saying, yeah. we were saying, this is the trick. We were standing unashamedly and collecting and building an army, building a, you know, so that. And, the, and again, what the, we were, again, this was God. This was God, ahead of the curve because of God. I'd said, wouldn't it be amazing if at the touch of a few buttons, we could send this information to lots of people? So there weren't email lists. There wasn't, you know, there so weren't. So it's your fault we've got email lists. <laughs> <laughs> there weren't email lists. There weren't social media campaigns. I know no one can believe this, but it's really true. Yeah, I and was everybody there. would really laugh that everyone, you know, everyone knows how wonderfully terrible I am at, social, at, at technical platforms. But the point was, my dream, I said, it would be incredible if through this mechanism, 
we could apply pressure. Yeah. And you know the kind of pressure we applied? We shut down the home office telephone lines once. Wow. By just sending out, call at this time, mm -hmm. ahead of this vote. You know, and, and we this is the kind of campaigning we were suddenly doing. Mm -hmm. People were changing their phone numbers because at that time we could apply that pressure. Right. Um, and it was all, this was a, this was God because I was using what he put in front of me and I inputted all those emails myself. They would sometimes take 24 hours to go. Right. All those emails yeah. <laughs> through that we've been yeah. putting in. Through dial-up. Through, yeah. <laughs> That's exactly... Making funny noises. David Clark was doing that. Right, being Dave told you have to get off the phone because <laughs> the internet's not working. That was it. That, I mean, those were, the, that, those were the days. But it was kind of... It, so I think we were involved in the very, really early sort of digital campaigning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was, uh, that was that. And then we officially were, were formed in um, 2008. And the story of that... You want that story? I do. I want all the stories, Andrea. <laughs> but the, 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 the story of 2008 is there had been a hit documentary on me. Um, that taught me a lot. But it followed, that it was, just sounds terrible. It, it was a hit. I feel defensive. But, yeah, but, but it was a... I love I loved the media. Generally, I love the media. And I was... It was a Channel 4 Dispatches. And a guy, a guy called David Medell was going to follow me because he said, I want to tell the real story and how you're advocating for life. This was now the Human Fertilization and Embryology Act of 2008, when we were trying to bring the upper time limit down on, on for abortion figures and, and so on, and stop animal-human hybrid embryos. And I gave him a lot of access to me. Um, I was always aware that he was, a he was a media guy, but he followed me a lot. But it was a it became a hit documentary. Right. Um, and um, the on just and then on the day of the the day of the vote on this, he well the, it, it was the Sunday before the vote. A big double page spread came out in the Telegraph, and then the documentary came out. Um, this was very bad for the whole. Well, this felt very bad to me. Yeah, for the for the uh, policy. It, and the it felt very and, bad yeah. because they were going to say these religious fundamentalists yeah, have been impacting. When I look back and... now, I can see I can see with much, a much clearer vision what it would have actually looked like. Yeah. And, and that that's experience for you. So it was a very big learning curve mm. at that point. And, and how did you feel? Because you know, you talk about this, you're you know, you're, you're confident, you're brave, yeah. you're high energy, but you know, Remembering back and not with twenty twenty yeah. hindsight, like, how, how was that for you? You know, like how did you feel? I, in real time, I was. In real time, the truth would have been, I love you, Lord. Mm. Uh, I've done my best. I'm sorry I've got this wrong. Oh wow! Um, and I was devastated, and and I remember the night before the. Um, the vote, um, that, and it was the night that the documentary aired. So it was the Tuesday night, and the um, it may have been a Monday night into the Tuesday that the documentary aired. And I remember not sleeping and crying. Yeah, wow. Well. But then um, took the child took the um, took the older two children just parked up at the um, railway station in Haywards Heath. And a knock came at the window of the people carrying my car. And um, a lady appeared and I didn't know her. And I took my two little girls up to the train station because they used to have a five minute ride to the local, uh, to where they went to school. And this lady said to me, the word of the Lord went out at last night, Andrea, do not be afraid. The word of the Lord went out last night, Andrea, do not be afraid. And then she disappeared. Then, um, having got the little ones, the, the, so having got the two older ones to school, um, I went back and got dressed, put on my suit, came up to London. We were rallying. We had, were presenting a petition in front of to 10 Downing Street, and there was a major vote. Mm. Somehow that day, I survived that day. We didn't win. And... I uh, came home on the train 
And a man got off the train in Croydon on my way home. And he said to me, the word of the Lord went out last night, Andrea. Do not be afraid. The word of the Lord went out last night, Andrea. Do not be afraid. And when I look back now, I mean, that wasn't... And when I look back now, that was as if there were two angels that yeah. day that, that had... that, And I, I, that was it. It felt like there were two angels. But what it meant was that was really the catalyst for the Christ, Christian concern and the Christian Legal Centre becoming entirely independent of the Lawyers Christian Fellowship. There'd been the, lawyers, the hit documentary, and so we became entirely independent. We yeah. became officially recognised. We were given a room. Mm-hmm. Um, a, my friend, my colleague, gave me a room for free in the West London, the offices that we currently, we now occupy the whole building, but I was given a desk, basically, with my interns right. for free right. in 2008. And that's how we were officially formed after that, after that in 2008. Eight weeks later, I was diagnosed with an aggressive breast cancer. Wow. Um, so... So that's 2008. We're still in... After two, the bill. After the bill. And um, had three interns and Ade and Sam and all the others were around. Um, I was very, very sick. Um, And I remember, and it sounds dramatic, but I remember being uh, in a third round of chemotherapy. I had an infection and I was on a drip in the hospital because I was so unwell. And I remember calling a donor because we couldn't pay the month end bill. And I remember, I was really sick. And I remember calling and asking, saying, I've got, you know, um, I don't think we can, would you be able to help? Now, the donor didn't help. As, that, that's fine. I mean, that, 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 but um, the nurse that night said, said to me, um, I went into this kind of, all through the night, these 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 mate these ma- you know when you get this is it called zygos when you kind of are going in and out of um, consciousness yes and, and and just absolutely drenched my whole body was continually drenched and she said I get and the more she said, we nearly lost you last night Andrea but the point was actually I was when I kept when I eventually came around that morning I was better you know so I, she said we nearly lost you but I knew that I wasn't going to die that I wasn't going to die. But I did call Ade and the interns and got them uh, once I got out of the hospital and said, can you come? Can you come? And I said, I think the Lord has given me permission to stop. Wow. I don't think we, ha- I, the bill has been finished. I've been really, I'm, I'm fighting cancer and there is no money. Mm-hmm. And they Feels said. Feels like all the doors are shut, yeah. And it did. <laughs> and, but the, um, my interns, at the time, I said, we're not going anywhere. Ugh. We're not going anywhere until there really is no money. And um, and so, uh, you know, here we are. Um, we're here 15 years later. There's not always that much money in the bank, but yeah. <laughs> despite yeah. what the yeah. newspapers say. <laughs> but the truth is, again, that same faith that was there is the faith that is today, that trusts God for mm-hmm. the provision, it's a it's a story of great of great miracles, and we are still here today, with a with a staff of um, uh, with 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 consultants around the thirty five, um, wonderful interns that are in the studio, wonderful interns twenty twenty three interns that are in the studio with us now as we film, you know, providing new energy and next generation and and energy, and so that was so the point was the Lord. Again, that was a thing where I wasn't given permission to stop. I, I you tried wanted to, to stop. get out. Yeah. Tried to get out of it. <laughs> God wouldn't I, let you. I tried to get out, and and uh, there was a set. Why, well, and Andrea? Everyone at home is going to yeah. want to know how are you now? Well, I've had the return of cancer. I've had the return of cancer, so that um, that was breast cancer. Um, I had a mastectomy, and um, then I had a return in twenty sixteen. Um, to, and that work to my womb and my so my womb and ovaries are, are removed. I often say I'm kind of I it's extraordinary. I'm kind of like this kind of clank. I've got this. I definitely I'm definitely alive, but I'm kind of like so much stuff is being removed. <laughs> um, and another another then another sort of precancerous threat again. So, but you know what about it all is that um, 
I'm also about, as I film with you now, um, I'm about to run my 12th marathon. Wow. Since cancer, because coming back from cancer was, um, I, I, I'd, um, I got cancer at age 46. I was, I was, um, I had said on my 40th birthday to myself only, I'd love to run a marathon for my 40th birthday. I didn't do it. So when I came back from cancer, I, I, I wanted to run the New York marathon. I said, I'm going to run the New York marathon. And um, so I did. And um, I'm about to run on in just this, in four days or something, I'm about to run my 12th. Um, I don't run very fast, but God is very good. <laughs> uh, and, um, and, uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm still here. And, and there's a sense in which, again, you know, um, life is very brief anyway. Mm-hmm. It is very brief. In, in the expanse of eternity, it's, it's, it's but a moment. It's but a moment, yeah. But the um, I want my every day to count. Yeah. And um, he's given me my every breath, mm-hmm. you know, and um, I trust him for it. I cannot, and when I had cancer, my darling sister-in-law also had cancer, but she had a worse cancer and she died. The wife of David Clark, who who created that website, Claire Clark. These became my best friends in ministry. She recently died of a cancer. Mm. I don't take for granted, I don't, I've lived, I kind of live alongside cancer journeys because I know them. Yeah. And I know the reality of them. And I, you know, and I, I believe in a, a healer God, but I also know that he has time allotted. Mm-hmm. And so I'm very glad, I'm very glad for my life. But I, and it, cancer has, um, the work is much harder than cancer. I mean, for me, I mean, what I, what I, I don't, I'm, when I say that, please understand how I'm, what I mean by that is that um, cancer is hard. Yeah. Get, cancer is hard. And, um, uh, and my heart goes out to anyone with cancer and all of this. You're not diminishing but, it. But I'm not diminishing it any way. But for me, the agony of the work, the agony of, um, when I say that, the agony of a of a parliament that turns away from Christ, a church that turns away from Christ, mm-hmm. um, the agony of people not knowing Christ, mm-hmm. the agony of how our children are being taught, the agony of abortion statistics, ten point two million, the the agony of a world that doesn't care about God's truth, mm-hmm. that that really hurts my heart. Mm-hmm. I mean, that really hurts my heart. And so you, you can see it driving you, Andrea. Andrea, can I can I ask you some of the practicalities of, you know, the the Christian legal centre and yeah. Christian concern? Because I just want you know we talked about that, and and I, I'm really interested in. So it seems like there's like an advocacy, yeah. you know, uh, um, arm which is Christian yeah. concern, and then the practical yeah. helping That's people it. with their legal cases. But it strikes me that uh, legal cases are incredibly expensive, like you know. Who pays for that? Like, how how do you make that work? Yeah, well, because I guess all your clients don't come with bags of money going. Please, can they're you help all me? served. It's really important for our clients. It's really really important that they know they've come to a place where they're loved and they're protected. Yeah, and that we will do. We will seek justice for them. Yeah, and that they do not need to worry about the money. That that it's a work of faith. So we so they they we they all. We, we literally, we, they come into our Christian concern family and from that moment, we're like family. Yeah. And, we're obviously and, and lawyers. that's what everyone said, Andrea. I mean, it's it's uh, easy for you to say it, but my experience of uh, people ref- like talking about their experience of dealing with Christian concern has honestly, honestly been uh, one of feeling more than just a client, you know, more than just having their legal needs uh, served that actually everyone on your team is... Uh, somewhat pastoral and also serving people's uh, personal needs yeah. as well as that economic need yeah. to, to to go through uh, what is a very expensive process yes where you have to where you need to know how to navigate it you need to know all the tricks yeah I, I they're always new tricks but I'm we, you know we are very experienced. We know what the opposition does. We know what, as in the opposition of the devil, but also just like the worldly opposition. We know, we know all all of those things. We've got a lot of between us, um, between us in the Christian concern, Christian legal centre. We've got a lot of experience of that. Mm. 
we're not fearful of man, we're fearful only of God. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't panic. It's really important not to panic. Mm-hmm. Um, the financial provision for the work is still the one thing that that um, that I find quite hard because I that that's I find it quite hard because there's a lot of money to find. Yeah. But the law that the law keeps the law keeps us going. Mm. I mean, I find that harder than going and doing a court case. Yeah. Um, so, so all of that is um, that is real. No, but but. but but you, you, I guess you're donor funded then, right? We're donor funded, entirely donor yeah, funded. Yeah, so you're not very... getting government grants, you know. Yeah, it's just, and, and that is hard work. Yeah. You know, for anybody at home listening, also running a ministry where yeah, yeah. we're donor funded, you know, uh, we get accused of asking all the time. Yeah. If you don't ask, people don't yeah, give. And, that's it. And actually, both of us probably are exhausted of asking. Yeah, yeah. And yet, I know I have to, so I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think what's, I think when you actually look at the legal fees of the opposition, right. Council people, the things that people charge. Your great that, value. <laughs> yeah. We, we are, this is the thing, you know, I feel like we, you know, it's it's hundreds, it's hundreds of thousands of pounds of work every single year yeah. if we were to have charged it, but right. we don't. Right. We don't. Right. And we, and so um, if we were to have charged it according to our expertise. Right. Um, but we work, um, we all, you know, people take salary cuts to come and work with us, but I think it's important also, as the chief executive, I, I think it's really important for people to be paid well, yeah. uh, well enough to live. Of course. Um, that's important. Um, and, you know, and I think that we need to honour those amongst us in all our ministries, in all ministries, yeah. um, across, you know, in, in Christian work, we need to look after one another. Yeah. So that, you know, so that we can Pay raise our families. Jews, and you look it's after in the Bible. Them, yeah. Yep. Yeah, no, it's just interesting. I think it's good for people to get an insight of yeah. like, you know, like, uh, that the, when you're doing all these cases, there's the running of a business and everything else on the side of it yeah. uh, as well. So, um, Andrea, I just wondered, there'd be a lot of people at home who are, you know, going through cancer journey challenges, yeah. uh, you know, setting up uh, yeah. ministries, yeah. Uh, wanting to hear God more clearly. I, I wondered if there's uh, something you want to say to the partners at home or whether you want to pray for people at home, yeah. just to encourage them in, yeah. in their battle, in their journey. Yeah, yes, yeah. Never doubt God's love for you. He is for you. Nothing can separate you from him. Uh, he knows you. He wants to shower you, flood you with his peace and his presence and his healing and his wholeness. And indeed, um, I'll pray now for you. Father God, for all those that are hurting, uh, whether uh, emotionally, mentally, physically, Father God, I pray that even in this moment that you would uh, meet them, that uh, your presence would be beyond anything that the world can give, that you will uh, flood them with your peace, that they might be still deep in their soul and know the transforming, perfect peace that only you can give. And Father God, I pray healing into the heart's mind bodies and souls of uh, all those that are listening and praying with me right now, Father God, that you would, by the power of your Holy Spirit, come to them, flood them, so that they might know your love. And Lord Jesus, I pray this in your most wonderful and beautiful name. Amen. 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 Andrea, I know we've only really touched the surface and we've been talking for a, a while. I, I just want to uh, thank you and honour you for everything that you've done and are doing through Christian Concern and the Christian Legal Centre. I, I personally want to thank you for giving us access to some of your clients and uh, letting us tell their story yeah. as well. Um, I hope that if people have watched this, they will go and watch some of the other podcasts yes. that we've filmed with their stories because what they say um, about what you do and uh, listening to their stories really highlights the need for Christians to come together and stand together. And everything you've said today wonderfully frames and gives context to uh, why we need to stand up for people who are being persecuted. Um, 
in, in, in the West for having a faith no. in schools, in the community, no. you know, uh, by standing up for Christian beliefs because they are a protected characteristic yeah. in the UK. Yeah. Um, and there are services that people can go to. I know we haven't told the whole story of Andrew Williams mm -hmm. and the whole story of Christian concerns. So I just encourage everybody at home, if you've enjoyed meeting Andrea today, like go and check out Christian Concern. We'll put all the links uh, in the uh, comment section below. Uh, and I just hope that you go and have a look at like what they're doing. And if you so feel like it, please, you know, if you're able and willing, uh, you know, go and support Christian Concern because what they're doing uh, in the court uh, is affecting and changing your life as a Christian uh, and not only your life, but your children's lives uh, and, and what kind of future do we want to live in. So, Andrew, you know, on behalf of myself and all the God TV team, we say thank you very much. It's been a real privilege uh, and honour to meet you and get time to chat with you today. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you're very, you're very, very <laughs> welcome. Uh, and Andrew, as always, we like to thank the people that have helped us do this today. So behind the cameras, we we have David, Noah and Lloyd. Um, and yeah, we, we just thank everybody at home for watching today. So if you know what to do, if you've liked this, like, subscribe, share, comment, tell us what you think, whether you like it, whether you don't. Uh, we want to engage with you and meet you and this be part of the public discourse. So do get involved because also it helps the message go fa further faster. Uh, we want as many people to know about the good work that Christine Concern and Andrea are doing. So you play your part and we'll continue bringing you fantastic content with amazing guests who r really are uh, sergeants in the faith and who we're privileged to get to spend time with. So on behalf of God TV, Andrea Williams, Christian Concern, and all the God TV family, we say thank you, God bless you, uh, and we'll see you next time on God TV Together, the podcast.